Well, this is a really great thrill for me to be here presenting for you today. Um, so with that, I'll say good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. So happy to have you with me today, <laughs> um, especially after last night's ball. If you were able to attend, I'm sure you had a nice morning this morning. <laughs> I did. Um, <laughs> So um, today we're going to discuss the link between home economics, um, the pattern industry, and um, the perceptions of women in the workforce through the deco period. Um, so I have to tell you, there was a time in this nation, oh sorry, I'm getting a little feedback here, what am I doing? <laughs> All right, bugs, bugs aside. Um, so I have to tell you, there was a time in this nation when the general impression existed mind you, it's a long time ago, that a girl could, um, you know, grow up without any knowledge of homekeeping or, um, you know, anything. And when it came time for her to fall into her domestic ways, um, after she was married, she was supposed to, poof, snap her fingers and become this, um, trigger this primordial ability to <laughs> sew, cook, clean, um, budget, uh, you know, account for the children. Um, she was supposed to be able to do everything that her household required her to do. Um, naturally so, right? Women have always kept house. Um, it's just, you know, the way that it's been. Mothers, maternal nature, all that. Um, so it's, it's easy to see why it was regarded as a woman's natural province um, that required her no training whatsoever. Um, so, as I'm sure anyone in this room who's tried to complete such a, I'll say in quotations here, menial task as, let's say, doing laundry, throw that beautiful, nice, new 1930s wool sweater into the washing machine <laughs> with no concept of what felting is, right? That's whereby wool becomes dense when heat, pressure, and uh, moisture are applied. Um, yeah, and effectively ruined it. So I think if, if, you, if you've ever done that or thrown a red shirt in the white wash, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. It's not simple housekeeping, right? There's a little bit of science that goes on behind it. Um, so that notion actually dismayed so many women, our ancestral women, um, that they actually created this idea of home economics, right? Um, it was such a ridic ridiculous notion that women should not have any training to go into it, that um, during the early 20th century, many women um, who studied home economics really took it as a profession um, and an educational pursuit. Um, so that required years of earnest study, and um, thus, the, uh, thus the home economics movement was started. Um, and this was also a time, the early 20th century was also a time when great educational opportunities and reformations were coming about. So women were finding themselves on a more equal um, playing field with men. I mean, it wasn't where we are now, but definitely they were, they were coming up um, in that way. Uh, women were finding that they could even be economically independent of men, um, which was a really I, a novel um, thing at that time. So, um, and, but even though women, you know, were now entering the workforce in the early 20th century, they could do, you know, a womanly job, as so deemed acceptable, you know, a stenographer or secretary, um, bookkeeping, um, they, it was still considered, at least by the National School of Home Economics, that any woman would eventually fulfill her real mission in life to become a, home, a housemaker and a wife. <laughs> That's a quote, a quote there. <laughs> um, so, uh, everything from dedicated schools, literature, um, books on the subjects were written about home, home, econo um, home economy, and um, they covered every facet of home management from good housekeeping, um, nutrition and food pep preparation, um, home dressmaking and millinery, etc. Um, so, today, we're gonna focus on home dressmaking just because it's so expand home economics is so expansive that it would take us hours to cover everything. Um, so, for the, uh, let's see, what else? I've got to tell you, I'm pretty darn nervous today. <laughs> this is my first lecture that I've given, but um, I'm really excited to see everybody here, and I just want to say thank you again. Um, so yeah, I'm just putting that out there. <laughs> if I stumble a little bit, just bear with me. <laughs> 
So this is kind of our schedule, our outline of where we're going for the day, um, or through this discussion. Um, and uh, let's see. So what we will discover through the course of this lecture is that the impact of home economics actually wasn't just, it was, it was massive. Um, not only did it empower women to join the workforce, uh, not only did it change social perceptions of women in the workforce and change the whole family dynamic, um, it also was big enough to spawn a whole new industry, the home sewing market. Um, before the early 20th century, it didn't exist. Um, so sewing patterns, um, you know, thread companies, sewing machines, it all kind of came up in this, in this movement. Um, and that's really actually amazing for one idea or one, you know, educational idea to spawn a whole industry. I mean, this is like a $4.3 billion industry today. Uh, that's pretty amazing, and it's global. Um, so, and also to truly understand the impact of, of all that, we have to kind of look at the socioeconomic trends and, and um, all those trends that were happening and changes that came about. So, um, let's see, as far back as the 19th century, um, the learning courses and books, it was identified that, that women needed these things. And the term home economics um, was actually co coined during the first ever Lake Placid um, conference in 1899. This was when, uh, when a group of highly educated women who were well respected in the uh, academic field um, came together and identified the need to have some sort of course learning, something structurally there, a foundation um, to kind of move women. It wasn't just to help them with their households. It was kind of seen as having a background in home, uh, home econ um, economy uh, prepared them for careers in the future as well. So um, that, there was a big push for that. So let's see. Um, oh, this is a fun fact here. So it prepared women to enter the workforce for future decades. And um, actually, the, the participation rate of single women um, met its peak in World War II. And uh, after that, it was a steady uh, movement of women into the workforce that has never abated. Um, and it started actually in World War I, but uh, World War II was when it peaked. So anyway, um, I'm going to show a little video that kind of, it's a little tongue-in-cheek. Um, it's really tongue-in-cheek. It's, it's just about, uh, just watch it and you'll laugh. <laughs> I don't know. New York, Hollywood, art museums, historical costume, world events. Today, these are the sources from which comes inspiration for the fashion designer. Johnny, be careful, you'll tear my pattern. How did you get in here anyway? Just open the door. Look, I've got some new records, let's try them. But first I have to decide on the material for my new dress. Ah, oh, just like a girl. Always thinking about new clothes. Do you make all your own clothes? Sure. Lots of us girls do. But your clothes look so professional. Johnny, don't you know that the most professional looking clothes are those made by hand? Individually? You don't think that people like well, movie stars buy their clothes off a rack, do you? Well, no, but gee, the people that make their clothes are professionals. You're just a high school girl. Gee, maybe you ought to be a designer yourself. Well, silly, I am a designer for myself. We learn that in our home economics classes, too. Besides how to fit and sew like a professional. You sound as if dressmaking is an easy thing. It is. I just let my pattern tell me what to do, and it comes out all right. That's right, Betty. Let the pattern tell you. Your pattern. Tissue paper stuff. But in this facile frame, there is enough of glamour, charm, enchantment, and allure to set young hearts afire. And we can cure that curve or bulge you'd like to lose if you think carefully before you choose. That the um, sewing industry and, and home sewing was done 
domestically, professionally, everything. It was amazing. Um, and eventually, the introduction of reliable sewing machines in the 1860s really accelerated home production um, for waged and unwaged purposes. Um, and so, but of course, you had to be able to afford it. So the first uh, models were uh, about 100 to 125 dollars. And you have to consider that at that time, the annual salary of many Americans was $500 a year. So that's pretty, yeah. <laughs> Um, so, and then finally, the, the circulation of um, well-illustrated books, magazines, fashion plates, um, and patterns eventually um, increased the knowledge of home sewing, knitting, embroidery, and any other home handicrafts. Um, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of commercial patterns. Um, so sewing patterns were actually initially invented as a way to assist the home sewer um, to make her own clothing. In the 1860s, prior to the availability of mass-produced patterns, um, the majority of women had to either draft, no, have knowledge to draft a pattern by hand, or your alternative was to take it to a seamstress or a tailor, somebody who had that knowledge, and, um, or you could cut up your own existing garment, which, I mean, at that time when you weren't making a lot of money, you didn't have a lot of clothing, that could be really risky for an amateur, uh, you know, homemaker. I don't know if any of the, anybody out there, if you've ever taken apart a pattern or a piece of clothing and tried to put it back together, it's much like taking apart an engine and like, oh crap, now I've got all these <laughs> pieces. Where do they go? Where do they fit? What do I do? Um, and I'm sure we all have that sewing pile that's just like, you know, behind the curtain. <laughs> um, so... Uh, by the early 1800s, actually, they started introducing um, patterns such as this. So if you didn't know what you were doing, this, is, this could be very challenging. I, yeah, this, this is how they would sell patterns. This is, um, yeah, it's a one size. You don't know the size. Um, it, would, you, it would require you to trace the overlay onto multi, either multiple different pieces of um, paper. I mean, we didn't have scanners and copiers back then, so everything was traced by hand onto tissue paper and then cut out in the fabric, and then you had to kind of figure out how, to, how it all went together. There were no instructions, no markings, um, pretty, pretty crazy.